The topic I chose to do my presentation on is race as a factor in admissions. I chose this topic because I felt that it was relevant to our age group since we are in college, and it's also something interesting for teachers to learn. This is for the teaching professional, and it is created by myself, Kylie Fellows. So I first wanted to go over the term affirmative action. The definition of affirmative action is it is the policy of favoring members of a disadvantaged group who suffer from discrimination within a culture. It is used to achieve goals of increasing access to education, promoting diversity, bridging inequalities, and redressing past wrongs. And the reason I bring up this term is because it's kind of the term used as race is a factor in admissions. It's called affirmative action. And it is used in employment and it is used in many college admissions decisions, as you will see in the coming legal cases and slides. The next thing we're just going to quickly review is the Equal Protection Clause because it comes up a lot in the legal cases to come. So the Equal Protection Clause is part of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. It prohibits states from denying anything the equal protection of the laws. It means that you must treat individuals in the same manner as others in the similar conditions or situations. And to make a point, it's not intended to provide equality among individuals but it's only equal application of the laws. So I'll begin by going over five legal cases that have to do with affirmative action and whether or not race is an actual factor in admission, admissions decisions for certain colleges. The first case that I'll be talking about is the Regents of the University of California versus Bake. This happened in 1978. The next one is Hopwood versus Texas, and this happened in 1996. The next case is Gratz versus Bollinger. This happened in 2003. Grutter versus Bollinger, which has also happened in 2003. And then the last case I'll be discussing, which is also a current event, is the Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin, which started in 2013 and is still ongoing to today. So the first case is the Regents of the University of California versus Bake that happened in 1978. The case, the respondent, was Alan Bake, who was a white 35-year-old applicant to the University of California, Davis Medical School. This school reserved 16 spots out of the 100 in any given class for disadvantaged minorities as part of the university's affirmative action program to address any unfair minority exclusions from the medical profession. Bake's qualifications, which include his college GPA, and test scores exceeded those of any of the minority students admitted in the two years Bake's applications were rejected. Bake contended, first in the California courts, then in the Supreme Court, that he was excluded from admission solely on the basis of race. He sued the university saying that his denial of admission was on racial grounds and that it violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So, the court ended up ruling that the medical school at the University of California at Davis could not reserve slots with separate admission standards for minority applications because it did violate the Equal Protection Clause. It also ruled that colleges could consider race and ethnicity in admissions decisions as long as they did not use quotas. And an example of a quota is setting aside a number of class seats for minorities. The next case I'm going to talk about is the Hopwood versus Texas case that happened in 1996. In 1992, Cheryl Hopwood applied for admission to the University of Texas School of Law. She had an undergraduate GPA of 3.8 and achieved a score of 160 on the LSAT. When these accomplishments were combined, Hopwood's scores placed her in the university's presumptive admit category of applicants. The University of Texas, however, operated a dual admission system that required lower admission qualifications for favored minorities than for all other races, and since she was white, this put her in the different category. Even though Hopwood possessed excellent qualifications, the university denied her admission and instead offered admission to 62 students from the favored minority track. Of those 62 admitted students, Cheryl Hopwood held a better combined LSAT and GPA score than all but nine of the other students. So in turn, she ended up filing a lawsuit against the university, and it ended up being a historic victory in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. 
the Fifth Circuit ruled, ruling barred all use of racial preferences in university admissions in the states under that court's jurisdiction. Since the Supreme Court declined to hear the case, the victory became constitutional law in the Fifth Circuit and universities in the states of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi were prohibited from using racial preferences for over seven years. So basically, at the end, the ruling affirmative action unconstitutional, and it also led to the top 10% law, which we'll talk about in the next case. So these next two cases that I'm going to talk about, I put together because they ruled the most important since the big case 25 years ago. The first one is Gratz versus Bollinger. This happened at the University of Michigan, who received a high volume of applicants each year to its College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. And in order to help with admissions decisions, the university implemented a point system. This point system is out of 100 points. And basically, a student that is from an underrepresented, underrepresented group automatically receives 20 points towards his or her overall score. The groups of students typically come from African American, Hispanic, and Native American backgrounds. A student with extraordinary artistic team receives five points under the admission system. Also, every student that is from an underrepresented group and is otherwise qualified is typically accepted into the school. A group of white students that were determined qualified by the university were denied admission, and that is where this case has gone. At the time that Jennifer Gratz applied, the university analyzed prospective applicants under a grid system. Gratz had a combined ACT and GPA scores that placed her just outside of that presumptive admit portion of the grid that used to analyze her results. But, however, the university had a separate grid for analyzing potential applicants it considered underrepresented minorities. On this second grid, Gratz's score placed her far above the minimum threshold of automatic admissions. So, Gratz's achievements gave her a competitive chance of gaining admission, but if the university had considered Gratz as a favored minority applicant, she would have had a 100% chance of gaining acceptance to the university. So for Gratz, race was the difference between rejection and acceptance, which is a huge deal. The Supreme Court reasoned that the point system, you know, assigning points based on outward characteristics, treated applicants in a manner that prized their race over their individual accomplishments, and that the failure of the university to treat applicants as individuals constituted a violation of the 14th Amendment. And now the next case, Grutter versus Bollinger, also happened in 2003. With this, it was the University of Michigan School of Law that used a grid system to evaluate potential candidates for the admission, just like the undergrad admission process. Um, the, the, the respondent's name was Barbara Grutter, and she was a white female applicant. She had a less than 9% chance of admission on the grid that they used. However, if under the same system, a favored minority applicant with the same score had a 100% chance of gaining admission. So, as with Gratz, Grutter's race was the difference between automatic acceptance and automatic rejection. The Supreme Court reasoned, actually, that fostering diversity in higher education is a compelling government interest. So, because this was higher education law school, they felt that it was in its constitutional rights to consider applicants' race and ethnicity, because it also did so in a holistic review and not simply just awarding points based on race and ethnicity like the undergraduates program had done. Before we move on to this last legal case, it is important to note that the 2003 cases, both of them, the Supreme Court ruled that the use of affirmative action in school admission is constitutional if it treats race as one factor among many. Its purpose is to achieve a diverse class, and it does not substitute for individualized review of ap the applicant, but is unconstitutional if it automatically increases an applicant's chances over others simply because of his or her race. Now on to the final case, Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin, starting in 2013 and continuing on to today. So as discussed earlier, because of Hopwood, the Texas legislature passed the Texas 10% plan because of the fall off of the number of African Americans and Latinos in Texas schools. Under this plan, students graduating in the top 10% of their high school classes were guaranteed admission at the Texas State School of their choice. Eventually, not enough minorities were being accepted, so then race was 
beginning to be considered in its holistic applicant evaluations. The respondent in this case is Abigail N. Fisher, a Caucasian female who applied for undergraduate admission to the University of Texas in 2008. Fisher was not in the top 10% of her class, so she competed for admission with other non-top 10% in-state applicants. The University of Texas denied Fisher's application. So Fisher filed suit against the university and other related defendants, claiming that the university of use of race as a consideration in admission decisions was in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The university argued that its use of race was a narrowly tailored means of pursuing greater diversity. The district court decided in favor of the University of Texas and the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit affirmed the district court's decision. Fisher appealed the appellate court's decision and is now under the Supreme Court for the second time currently. But before it came to the second court, the first Supreme Court, way back in 2013, ruled that these lower courts needed to have more evidence and apply strict scrutiny and not give colleges deference and reviews of challenges to the consideration of race and ethnicity and admissions decisions. And that's when the Fifth Circuit Court came back and said they ruled in favor of the university and that it was okay to do so to obtain greater diversity. In essence, this case has the ruling has raised the bar for colleges in terms of how to justify the consideration of race and ethnicity and admissions, but it did not bar the use of racial preference. Now that it's back at the Supreme Court, it is a current event. It started in June 2015 again to hear it again. And um, they announced that they would hear the case again, hoping to have a decision by the following June. But because of the current event of Justice Scalia's death, it now seems that the decision will be delayed.